It is my absolute honor to introduce our next keynote speaker, Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo. Gina Raimondo is the first female governor of Rhode Island and has been largely credited for the amazing turnaround in the Rhode Island economy that has taken place since her election. Rhode Island went from one of the highest unemployment rates in the country to, the, for the first time in decades, an unemployment rate that is lower than the national average. Governor Mondo has made some incredible reforms. The one nearest and dearest to my heart is making Rhode Island the fourth state in the country to offer community college tuition free for every graduating high school student in the state. She gently shrugs off inclinations like that, the latest from the New York Times and its coverage of the National Governors Conference that happened here at the Rhode Island Convention Center that her unique type of pragmatism is what the country could use in 2020. It is my distinct and cherished honor to introduce my governor, the governor of Rhode Island, Gina Raimondo. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Hello. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, Nick is terrific, by the way. I'm sure you all have figured that out by now. But um, I love his energy, and he is totally committed to Rhode Island. I have to say, uh, without exaggeration, he just mentioned the Rhode Island Promise Program. That's the program whereby every high school graduate in Rhode Island can go to our community college tuition free. Uh, it might not happen without him and his advocacy, because I needed, for me, that's about business climate. That's not about giving anything away for free. That's about making sure every Rhode Islander has the job training and education they need to get a good job. And so I needed you know, support from the business community. And he really led the charge uh, behind that. And by the way, you know, wherever you're from, you know, IBM or other places, companies like yours want to be in states that have a talented and skilled workforce. So that was absolutely about skills. And I have to thank Nick for his incredible advocacy and leadership. A very funny story on how I met him. And then I'll talk about what we're going to talk about. Uh, several, many months ago, I was getting on a train to go from New York home to Providence. And I was on the train early, which never happens. Anyone who knows me knows I'm never early. Um, and I'm early sitting there chit-chatting with my neighbor. And suddenly, he says to me, um, he's going to Philadelphia. And I was thinking, that's funny. Philadelphia is south of New York, and I'm supposed to be going to Providence. Anyway, long story short, I was on the wrong train. <laughs> so my trooper and I hustled off the train. We missed our train, which was the express train. And we wound up getting on a regional train. It was crowded. I was just about late. And I sat next to this nice young man who happened to be Nick Inglis. And we struck, yeah, right? We struck up this conversation about IT and business in Rhode Island, getting more young entrepreneurs in Rhode Island. Fast forward, he's been amazing. We've done a lot of stuff together. And now I'm here before you guys. Um, how many people are not from Rhode Island? Great. Good. OK, so we have an opportunity to turn you into Rhode Islanders or fans of Rhode Island. Um, it is a fact that the best restaurant in Boston is in Providence. <laughs> you might say which one, and my answer would be many of them. So go out and have some fun. Have some fun when you're done working, because Providence is a terrific place. And as Nick said, um, we've done a lot of work over the past couple of years to turn the corner economically. Uh, when I took off, when I was elected at the end of 2014, we had the highest unemployment rate in the country, which is really hard to believe if you think about it, nestled between New York and Boston, just down the road from, from Boston's juggernaut of an economy. And the, you know we have great beaches, great universities, great culture, great everything. We were kind of stuck. I felt it was you know, a lack of leadership. So we've been investing like crazy. This year, we've become the first state in America to teach computer science. Uh, starting in kindergarten for our public school kids in every district. Um, yeah. Actually, I don't know if Microsoft is part of this. If not, maybe they will be next year. Microsoft, we partnered with Microsoft to do that. 
Uh, they had a great program. We partnered with them to do that. We, as we already talked about, the community college program, uh, we are allowing high school kids to take college classes for college credit for free. Thousands of kids have signed up for it. I met a girl the other day. She's going to start college as a junior because she racked up so many of these credits. You know, I came out of law school with like $80,000 of debt. I'm lucky I get rid of it. I married a guy with the same amount. Generally good move. That part was a bad move. Um, <laughs> but kids these days need a hand. So we're, you know, really investing. We've recruited 18 companies in the past 18 months including GE Digital, Johnson & Johnson, eMoney, Virgin Pulse. Uh, why do they want to be here? High quality of life, low cost of living and doing business, amazing universities, great talent on the eastern seaboard. I mean, it's a, it's a great place to live and do business. And they love it. I was at Johnson & Johnson the other day. They are thrilled and they want to keep growing and growing here. Um, so we really have economic vitality and we have absolutely have a sense of momentum, which is something that I'm proud of. And a lot of you folks in the audience who live and work in Rhode Island, I want to say thank you. You know, we believe in our state and we're working hard to make it better. Um, a few words on IT. I was talking to Nick and he said a lot of you guys are involved in IT implementations. I've learned since being governor, two and a half years, I've been governor for two and a half years, it's incredibly hard to get, it seems, to get IT implementations done correctly in the public sector. Um, We've done a lot of implements. So one thing about me is I like to do things, right? Like we're getting a lot done. I became governor to do things. And so I've hit go on a lot of different projects. And we've hit our share of snags on these implementations. Some have gone well. Um, we have uh, others that haven't. And the most complicated one is an integrated benefit system on our social services side of the house. So to set the stage for you, and I'm going to talk about it for a minute because I've learned a ton of lessons and maybe I can offer some thoughts to you that will help you serve your clients better. So the eligibility system that the state was using when I took office was uh, installed when Ronald Reagan was president. Like, I don't know, where's Nick? Was he even alive? Like that was so <laughs> long ago. Right? So. Why is it that we allowed a system to stay in place for decades? By the way, our DMV system, which I just replaced, was so old, it was incompatible for use with a mouse. <laughs> no, you can't make this up. And we just replaced it a month ago. So I felt, but by the way, all the governors before me presumably thought that was fine because they didn't try to switch it. Um, and with good reason, because it's tough politics. It's things are hard to get right. So anyway, we hit go um, on the defined eligibility system. Deloitte was the vendor. My predecessor signed a big, big, con multi-hundred million dollar contract with Deloitte. Uh, and it's pretty much been a disaster, um, unmitigated. We're starting to turn the ship now. So what are some lessons learned and maybe thoughts for you as you do your business? You know, first of all, um, I don't know that the state, when they signed the contract, really knew what it was getting into, how big of a system it was. We integrated all of our data, um, food stamps inc integrated with everything, including our health exchange. Right? It came about when the health, it, I think they signed it like in 2014, like when the health exchanges were coming about. But our vendor knew. Because they had done this in Massachusetts, Kentucky, Florida, and other places. And so if I, you know, what I would have done differently, and again, I wasn't here when that happened, but is require the vendor to come forward and really let the customer know how big, how complex this is going to be. Because I'm not sure we staffed it appropriately. Um, states are notoriously, you know, understaffed in IT. It's incredibly hard for us to get talent, uh, we can't pay what the private sector pays, you know, all the challenges, they're real challenges. So if you're going to be working with city and state governments, like, acknowledge that. Chances are your client is, gonna, is going to not have the size and quality of staff that 
that you would want, that is ideal, and that you would get with a private sector client. So have a discussion at the beginning and acknowledge that and make a plan together to uh, you know, make sure that it works. Second thing, uh, second lesson I learned is communicate with the public ahead of time. So uh, I recently rolled out a successful implementation of our DMV system, <coughs> Department of Motor Vehicles. And one of the things that made it a success, we, first of all, we rolled it out incrementally. We started with one office. We have a handful of offices in different cities. We started with one office. <coughs> And we started with a reservation system. So before we went live everywhere full time, we deliberately scaled back our volume. And actually, and we said to people, if your license is, is coming up this month, I, we got a law, we passed a law that said um, everyone's automatically granted an extension. So we want you to stay home. We actually advertise stay home for the next 30 days. It's by appointment only. And don't worry, if something expires in that time, it's OK. We also worked with AAA and um, made it so that folks could go to AAA and not flooding our offices. That worked incredibly well. In contrast with our um, benefits system, the eligibility system, we didn't do that. We rolled the whole kit and caboodle out at once for uh, you know, 100,000 people. That didn't go well. Uh, and by the way, it's like these are people who are relying on us for their food stamps. You know, but 50 bucks matters. Getting into a nursing home. Mom needs to know, is she eligible? So this wasn't, this was very important and really regrettable um, that we rolled it out, I think, before it was ready without communicating to the public about the enormity of it and without rolling it out in some kind of an incremental way. And then the other thing I would say um, that I would offer to you, again, in the spirit of providing some useful thought so you can be better at your job, really do acknowledge that you're in it together with the client. There is nothing worse than being a client who is who's paid tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for a system that isn't working and being told that it's your fault. Like, don't do that. <laughs> even if both parties, you know, even if, as I've acknowledged, we have our challenges on our side, maybe the staffing wasn't fully where it needed to be, maybe the talent wasn't, you know, where it needed to be. It's like, if you want to be a top-notch client service professional, it's your problem. You, the client's problem is your problem. And the best client service delivery is to say, how do we together fix this problem? Not to say, if your team had done such and such, it would be better. And so that, I think, sounds easy. It's hard to do, right? These are, as we would say in Rhode Island, wicked, messy implementations. You know, hundreds and hundreds of professional services people on the ground for a long time. Things get messy. Finger pointing is not helpful. Really, it isn't helpful. What, and just owning the problem and focusing on, you know, what do we have to do to solve this problem? Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know better than we do. You know better than we do. Like, wherever you're from, and I, I see lots of IBM tags. I don't know. You know, but wherever you're from, you've done a lot more of these implementations than any individual city or state or department. So bring that to bear um, and be a real problem solver. For me, as a leader, I've just learned how to be straight with people, acknowledge when mistakes were made. You know, I've acknowledged we rolled out the system too soon. I put a whole new senior team in place. I get rid of two people in my cabinet. I get rid of my CIO. Um, I've held people accountable. We have new people in there. We've been way more transparent about our accountability. Um, working with our federal partners, that's the other thing. Whether it's FNS or CMS or federal <coughs> partners, get in there and help the client manage those relationships. Um, so 
you know, I know I've learned an enormous amount. I would say, so the final thing I'll say is, it's, at least in Rhode Island, and I know this is pretty much true in every state, we're really quite behind when it comes to technology. You know, I joke about the system not being, you know, compatible with a mouse. That's an extreme example. That's pretty typical. So when you guys are talking, you know, about data optimization and how do you use data to make decisions, um, chances are your client, if you're in the public sector, is like 10 years behind that. But we need to hurry up and catch up. Because if we're going to deliver services to people, like I would love to deliver more government services in a wireless capacity in a customer service friendly way. People, people get that in every other aspect of what they do. They ought to get that from their government. So I think what you're doing is, is like incredibly important. And I wish you the best in getting it right. Because what I care about at the highest levels is having a stronger democracy and a more engaged citizenry. Right now, people are frustrated with government. They're losing trust in government. I think the only way to fix that is to show them that government works. And bad IT implementations don't show people government works. Long lines at the DMV don't show people government works. Slick apps on their phone that they can get stuff done quickly and on time, that tells people government can get something right. So I would say the role you're, if you get your job right in the next decade and help people like me do a better job in delivering government services, it could have a tr truly transformative impact on this country and even on our democracy because it will restore people's faith in public services. So I wish you the best, and I'm happy to answer questions from Nick. Do you want to take a seat on the, sure. on the other side? Thank you so much. I, you talked about two major systems that were rolled out, one at the, the DMB and the, the major healthcare and services rollout. Um, one went fantastically well. Mm -hmm. Praise heaped on you from every newspaper. And in Rhode Island, praise in a, from a newspaper is a, a big thing. It never happens. It, it very seldomly happens. Um, so what, what do you think are were the, the main distinguishing features between those two rollouts? It, was it the, the partners that you, the, the state was working with? Is it um, just the, the lessons learned that, that can now be passed on to future implementations? What? Some of it was, um, as I said, the, the communication and the, our decision to roll it out incrementally so we could work out the kinks before we put the full volume through the system. Some of it was we, we leaned hard on our vendor to give us the A team. And they made some changes. And that made all the difference in the world. Uh, some of it was on our end. We made, we made management changes on our end. We, de we decided to delay the implementation, which I took some heat for, for delaying. But I said, we're not going to do It's better to get it right than to do it fast. So we delayed. We upgraded our team, and and that again that made a huge difference. So much of this, and you guys know, it's some of it is the technology. Like with our defined benefit system, we are struggling with technology. A lot of it is just human accountability, clear lines of accountability. So we shored that up on our end. We made the vendor do that, and we just waited. We did a ton of testing. We had an outside validator come in and test, test all the code you know, before we did it. It was just more testing, more training. Cannot do enough training, as far as I'm concerned. So you know, we just learned the lessons. And we, we hit the pause button and waited till we had it right. It, it's amazing how many of the themes from our previous keynotes and the messages that they've put forward are echoed in that. Isn't, isn't that pretty astounding? Um, for organizations and companies that serve the government space or haven't served the government space but have been serving private organizations and other companies, um, 
that have been doing more progressive work. Because right now in, in the, the public sector, um, companies that service the government, it's dominated by a few major players. Mm -hmm. What are some ways do you think, and this is sort of a, what are some ways that, that some newer, younger, more innovative companies can enter that space to bring some new life and revitalize the way that public services or public technology is able to be rolled out? Are there are any thoughts around? You know, I would think it wouldn't be that difficult because the, a quick Google search will bring up a string of failed IT implementations by biggest vendors. Um, and this isn't, you know, we're not talking about $5 million. I mean, this um, eligibility, unified eligibility system was a $200 million price tag, which is pretty typical. It's what Massachusetts spent. Kentucky was same. So if I were you, I would just diagnose what went wrong. And by the way, it's the same fact pattern in every one and offer, you know, a better uh, similarly priced solution. I, I think it's honestly ripe for the picking. I agree. That's why I asked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, are some, there are some companies out here that I think want to hear that too. Um, I, I, I want to thank you for your time today you and, and sharing. One thing, some of you should go into public service. You should think about it. You should think about it. You should. There's a lot of sacrifices. You're not going to make as much money as you make now. But it'll make a huge difference, even if you just did it for two, three, four years of your life. I just recruited a new CIO to my state. He came from Hasbro, which is a big local company here in Rhode Island. And he's great. And he's already making huge differences in the way we purchase. Just all the stuff you do or your private sector clients do and take for granted of, when brought into the public sector, could make an enormous difference make people's lives better, and save many millions of taxpayer dollars. So I'll make a pitch for it. You think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Absolutely. This way? Yeah, I'll take you up. Way.